Hello, YouTube world. Welcome to Mr. Natural's Music School here in San Francisco, California. Uh, welcome. We have been working for a while on ear training with dictation, and um, this tonight's going to be one of the one of the last nights so we're going to be working on this. We've gotten to a point now that we can pause and go on to other things that I promised on my first video which will be basically learning to read music by number on the staff. And I'll be showing you the secrets of what we call the picnons on the staff, which is actually a C staff. There are places where it's naturally short. And we'll show you how to visualize that. And then we'll show you how to build scales up on the staff by using the intervals. So you don't need any sharps or flats in the thing. And you'll be able to figure out how to do major and minor scales by just starting on any note you want and then put in the seven notes and figure out whether it needs sharps or flats by using these things called intervals and the interval patterns which we will help you learn to see. Um, to explain what's been going on I've been working basically on rhythmic dictation using a technique we call code words. Now a lot of people have been writing me and saying well Mr. Natural can we uh, can we have some of those or your rhythmic exercises you did once and can we um can we do some clapping games and can we yes of course you can do all that but that is not what this series is about this series is not a workshop to train you to do those rhythms this is a workshop to get you to recognize the code words now the reason that we're doing this is most people have a hard time reading rhythm I wanted to take a step further and show you that you can learn to read rhythm by learning to hear rhythm. And if you get the rhythms in your ear using code words and you write them down so your eye recognizes them, then when you go to the printed page and you look at printed music, you'll be able to do the rhythms immediately by using the code words. You'll be able to read. The emphasis is not on reading, but the goal was reading. And that's why last week we pulled out some Bach pieces and tonight we're going to pull out the third Bach piece. And by the way, just mentioning that last week and the week before in the Dibley do or the description down below, we do have the three Bach pieces as PDF files. And while I'm talking to you, you can go over and load the last one, which is the Polonaise. That's the one we'll be working on in about 10 minutes. So to get back to what I was talking about, um, why? One, people need to learn to recognize the symbols so they can read. And the best way to teach someone to read is to teach them to write. Writing is the fastest way to learn to read and to recognize reading, just as you did when you were in school. You learned to talk, the teachers taught you some alphabet letters, and then they showed you how to put the alphabet letters together into little words, and before long you were writing, okay? So there's an emphasis on writing and, and, and then you go and you pick up a book and you learn to sound out words and you start reading. So you're, learning, you're being trained to write, you're being trained to look at and recognize the symbolism, what they call those icons of the alphabet. You are trained to put those icons together in various ways to build up words and you learn these rules of phonics which eventually become rules of spelling and grammar. And so we're basically doing the same thing here. The reason I want you to pull out pencil and paper is another thing. People are using music programs, which is fine, but they don't know how to write the rhythms out and they're not sure about the scales and things. So although there are these programs that make it convenient for you to help write the things down, people don't know what to do with it. Okay? So this whole thing was to teach you how to at least, you should be able to sit down now and crank out four-part drum, drum pieces and uh, write and compose uh, drum lines uh, or what we call drum beats these days. Right? The other thing is using the code words and learning to read by writing out the thing, you develop a more fluidity. It's the difference between what we call a beat and a groove. And when you're counting one and two and three and you get a beat, the beat is like your heartbeat. But that's not where the liveliness in the music is. Where the liveliness in the music is, is in the phrasing and in the ability for you to state it uh, dramatically. It's like I can read a poem um, 
um, like I could read a poem like twinkle twinkle little star how I wonder what you are up above the and I could even do it with a meter but it's not interesting a dramatic reading of that would be for me to look at the story to find out what the story of Twinkle Star is about, read all five verses, get the overview, then come back in and do a dramatic reading of it. So I can do something like Twinkle Twinkle, Little Star, how I wonder what you are, up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. And what I'm doing with my voice is I'm speeding up, I'm slowing down, I'm getting loud, I'm getting soft, I'm making some things short, I'm making some things loud, and I'm putting accents on various symbols. All those things I just described are the things that we use for phrasing to turn these exercises into music, and to take written music as you see it written, and to turn it into something live. Now what code words allow you to do is you can speed up the rhythms, you can slow down the rhythms, you can say them louder, you can say them softer. You can move quickly, you can come to an abrupt stop, you can pick it up again. So all the things that we do for phrasing these rhythms to make them groove is something you can do using the code words and having written them down. Now people say, oh, I'm tired of writing these things down. Well, here's what's happening. You're not listening to the pencil. Remember in the very beginning I said, as you write the code words, tap them out with the pencil and listen to the pencil. So taking the pencil and going, bum, 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 going. That's making a rhythm. That's tapping it out on the paper. And tapping it out on the paper is the same thing as performing it. And if you listen to the pencil that you're performing, you will be able to control it. And the ability to control these things and to turn the actual flat rhythms into a groove to get away from the strict counting of the beat and get into the flow of the words or the poetry or the rhythm of the rhythms is the thing that expresses it emotionally. And that's what all of this was about, okay? It was getting you comfortable with seeing it, comfortable with reading it, and then later being able to use that to actually read music. And then because you can use the code words to read music, you can and express those code words comfortably, you can speed up, slow down, get loud, get soft, move the accent around, make some notes short, make some notes long, and do all the kinds of things that you need to do to phrase the music and change it from a count or a beat, boom, boom, your heartbeat, to the pulse, which is the blood flowing through the veins. Pressure in the veins is what the groove is. And it's the pressure in the blood in your veins moving through your body that creates rhythmic motion, not just the heart beating. And so counting tends to make us stiff and rigid and look at the rhythms in these very rigid fixed ways. But being able to say the code words as if you're stringing together nonsense poems or sentences allows you the freedom of it to flow. And also the side benefit is you can read music. And most of the code words that we've used, the 10 code words that we've been using here are the most common. You'll find, if you look around on the internet, some people show eight of them. Some people only show about six of them. And they show them to you by saying, da, da, di, da, or ba, 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 ba. They tap them out or they say them uh, percussively and you don't have anything in your brain that you can hang on to so you can't recognize them. Ear training is being able to recognize what you're hearing and writing it down. And that's what code words do. They allow you to recognize the rhythms that you're hearing, write them down so you get comfortable with the symbols or the iconography. And then when you look at music, you can see from the iconography how to express those rhythms. And then you can use your ability to flow into a groove to have this blood, life pulsing through your body to put that into the rhythm and express it so it becomes musical, okay? That's what this is about. Now, here's a piece of advice. All you who have been asking me, well, can I do the hand clapping things? Can I do the eurythmic exercises? Can we work, work on the or, or 
uh, things? Can we can we learn all these these uh, wonderful exercises that people like Gurdjieff and Ospensky uh, uh, developed, uh, or even going further back, the Tibetans have all kinds of dances and exercises that they did um, using symbols to help bring some kind of spiritual concept forward. All right, so <clears throat> we've been doing that here. And what I suggest you do to get more of that stuff is go to our workshops. Now there is, at the very bottom, we have all these things in a nice little row in one box called ear training. Next door is one called workshops. And about 10 years ago, Angel and I did these workshops where we took all these things that I've been doing in for the last 16 weeks and actually putting them into practice and using the ORF and using the body language and using things like gesture and using things like auditory sounding and various types of things like that. And we put that all together and all of that is in the workshops. Now we did those workshops at the San Francisco Public Library here and they went on for, I think uh, was 13 weeks. So there are 13 workshops of three hours in which we covered something like 80 exercises, clap patch exercises, uh, group playing exercises, band jam exercises, ways of doing it verbally, ways of doing it uh, in terms of body language and gesture, and all these things were ways to explain the difference between a beat and a groove and to get these things into our body. And how to use code words to band jam, make up rhythms. We had percussion things that are going on and you can watch those and join in with it yourself. Just when you see a group of people sitting there jamming on percussion instruments using the code words, well, just pull out a percussion instrument or clap your hands or do a patch clap right along with them and you'll get that stuff that you're looking for. So please go to the workshops. Now, online, I think I only have four or five of the workshops. I didn't put all 13 there. So the reason I only put four or five is we covered most of the things in those four or five and the other ones we just do it some more and more, and then later I wind up sitting down and doing the theory. What I did is in the workshops, we had people do all this stuff, and then at the end of the workshop, I sat down and explained the music theory behind it all and taught people how to read music on the staff uh, um, numerically and how to read melodies and chords, and then we also showed them how to write the rhythms out and do that, and we did a lot of ear training and eye training in those workshops. So please, go to the workshops to see how all of this stuff is applied, okay? So that's all I wanted to say about that. Today, um, I would like you to please, if you can, support us by going and buying our music book, Music Theory Decoded Strictly by the Numbers, written by Mr. Natural and Lin, Lin Vani. And you'll see the Robert Crumb logo of uh, Mr. Natural with a little oasis on it. And this is our theory book. You will find it on Amazon.com, and it is printed by and published by Lulu.com. If you go to Lulu.com and type in Mr. Natural, you'll not only see this book, but you'll see other books that we've done in which we have what we call Piano Tab, in which we're teaching kids uh, melodies and how to play them strictly by number. There are no ABCs, and they can be played in any key. We also have a device called the Intervalometer, and the intervalometer is something that I wanted to give away for free. And again, if you go to last week or the week before the Dibbly Doo and look in the bottom, you'll see there is a PDF file now of the intervalometer. And what you do is you get that PDF and you print it to the printer. And if you use double sided printing, what you'll get is the major and the minor uh, slider on either side and you'll be able to flip it over and you'll have the major slider. I don't have a copy of it here, but there'll be the major slider on one side and the minor slider on the other side, kind of like this. The blue side is your major intervalometer and then when you flip it over, you'll have the minor intervalometer. And the book shows you how to use this intervalometer. Now it means interval odometer like the odometer on your car, intervalometer. It's basically a ruler for intervals. And you put this behind the black keys on your piano and everything that we're gonna be doing from now on in terms of ear training, 
but in terms of spelling, different keys can be done with just this device. And anyone out there who wants one, you can download it for free. Okay, so let's look at the song that we're the box song we're going to do today, which is a polonaise. And the polonaise has a lot of the code words. It's actually one of the shortest pieces in the Bach book, but it has the most number of code words. So Lynn's going to bring the camera up close here so we can get it in. And we've had problems with the focus, so I'm going to move my hands around. Abra, Kadabra, automatically focus, iPad, maybe. Maybe it will. Who knows? Who knows? Okay, let's let Lynn in. The piano there. Yes. Okay, now that we should be able to, there it is. We can see the whole thing. Let me get the bottom in a little bit more. So this is the Bach Focus. There it is. <laughs> this is the Bach Polonaise. And as we said, it has most of the code words that we used uh, in this series. There's a only two, I think, that are missing from this. So first, we're going to look at the left hand. Now, this is called the treble clef, and it's actually an Old English way of writing the letter chi. And right there, that first note is on the line that this thing is bullseyeing, and that is the name letter G. Down here, we have a thing that is, if you take these dots and draw straight lines over, you'll recognize it as the Old English way of writing the letter F. And this is the letter F. And again, you'll see that it's hanging out on that line there, the second line from the top. And it's got little dots on either side. So again, it's bullseyeing. It's bullseyeing that note. So this note right here on that line is the letter name F. We don't need them. She's playing one, two, three, four. She's playing by number, okay? The bass clef is always the bottom part of the staff, and that is the left hand on the uh, intervalometer or the slider, and the top part or the treble clef, uh, also known as G clef, is the right hand. So we're going to take a look at the left hand first, and you'll see left hands are usually simpler in rhythm than the right hand and often carry the bass and some of the, some of the uh, chord notes. So let's take a look at it and see what it's like, and Miss uh, Lynn will play it for us, and uh, we'll kind of follow along. Are you ready? Anytime. Ready, set, go. Drum, 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 Tarzan, Tarzan, drum. Drum, 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 Tarzan, Tarzan. Now we're just gonna not repeat, we're gonna go on. So down here. And hum dee da drum 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 tarzan drum 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 tarzan 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 drum 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 Drum, 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 two, drum, 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 two. Now, as a little demonstration here, I'm going to sing it, and I'm just going to show you what I mean by flow. Drum, 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 tars and tars and drum, drum, drum. Drum, Tarzan, Tarzan, hum de drum, 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 Tarzan, drum, 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 Tarzan, 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 drum, 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 two, drum, 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 two, 
So you see, I was able to speed up and slow down quite easy. I was able to accent drum, 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 Tarzan, Tarzan, drum, 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 Tarzan, Tarzan. I can put accents anywhere I want. It's really easy to do and therefore express the music more musically instead of just reading it like it's some kind of an exercise. Okay, let's take a look at the right hand where all the complexity is at. We're starting out, of course, with a Humpty Dumpty. There's a Dumpty here, drum, drum, and then you'll recognize the Targator. You recognize Targators and, and, um, and uh, Tarsons. Targator, Alligators right here. See, Alligators right there. And more Targators and Targators. Tarzan, Tarzan, Targators, and it ends with a whole lot of Targators, Tarzans, and Targators, and drums. So let's have Lynn play it, and what we'll do is we'll follow along. Anytime you're ready, Lynn. Ready, set, go. Dumpty, drum, 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 Targator, drum, two. Targator, Tarzan, Tarzan, Targator, drum, two. Humpty, drum, drum, Targator, alligator, drum. Tarzan, Tarzan, alligator, Tarzan, Tarzan, alligator, Targator, Tarzan, Tarzan, alligator, drum, 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 Targator, Tarzan, Tarzan, drum, 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 Targator, Tarzan, Tarzan, Targator, Targator, Tarzan, Targator, drum. Drum. Okay? Now let's do that again, and this time just a little bit quicker, okay? You ready? One, whenever you want to go. Ready, set, go. Humpty drum, drum, Targator drum, two. Targator Tarzan, Tarzan, Targator drum, two. Humpty drum, drum, Targator alligator drum. Tarzan, Tarzan, alligator, Tarzan, Tarzan, alligator, Targator, Tarzan, Tarzan, alligator, drum, 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 Targator, Tarzan, Tarzan, drum, 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 Targator, Tarzan, Tarzan, Targator, Targator, Tarzan, Targator, drum. Now there I added some expression. I added some staccato notes where there were staccato notes. At the end of a phrase, I made that drum a little bit shorter. I was able, as I, you'll notice here, I was saying the code words, and then as I got into it, I actually started singing the melody. And as I sang the melody with the code words, it became more and more and more fluid. So one thing you should do is, the first thing I say is when you look at a piece of music, you see it or look at it, and recognize the rhythms. And in my head, I'll go through and say the rhythms. Then I go back and look at it again, and this time I say it. And when I say it, I don't just say the rhythms, but I'll also go back and say the numbers. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. And uh, along with the code words, and then play it. So it's look, read it, play it, um, see it, Say it, play it. See it, see the rhythms. Say it, say the intervals. Play it, play it on your instrument. Always, always in that order. And always take, every time people just jump into it, it gets stiff. And every time people go through this process where they look at it and analyze the code words first and try to say them fluidly, then they go and look at the interval patterns and try to say those fluidly and then they actually play it on their instrument, it's always, always better. And you're not stuck with the music making you count out beats and being stiff and rigid through the thing. It's not bum, ba, bum, 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 ba, 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 bum, ba, ba, bum, 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 ba, ba, bum. That's what happens when I count. But I can express it emotionally. Hum, de, drum, drum, Targator drum two, Targator Tarzan Tarzan Targator drum two, Humpty drum drum Targator alligator drum Tarzan Tarzan alligator Tarzan Tarzan alligator Targator Tarzan Tarzan alligator drum drum. 
So I can put all the emotional expression I need. And that is one of the reasons the biggest comment people have had when they meet me is I can pull out a sheet of music, set it on the stand, grab my saxophone or my clarinet or guitar, any one of 60 musical instruments that I can play, and I'll start playing it and they'll say, Mr. Natural, it's not stiff and rigid, it sounds emotional. You're putting feelings into it. How do you get the feelings out of reading music? Most people who read music, they have no feeling. And most people study music and learn it that way until they can let loose. And then when they know it and they're very familiar with it, then they can start putting some emotion and some style into it. But I can do that while I'm reading the music because of the code words. So now let's have Lynn play both parts and see if in your head you can see both parts going on and see which parts are going with each other in which are contrapuntally going against each other. For instance, in the second measure here, you'll see tar, gator, drum, two. But in the bass, it's drum while the tar gator's going on. Then while you're going drum, two up here, it's tars and tars. And so what Bach does quite often is when he has busyness here, he keeps it simple there. And when he has a big long pause up here in the right hand, he'll fill in the left hand with quicker figures. And you'll see that throughout all of his compositions. Okay, let's have the whole thing now. Are you ready? doing this tar gator tars and tars and tar in the bass it's drum two drum 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 just like a metronome and you'll notice that if you look at the phrasing markings which nobody looks at you'll see these little dots here these notes are staccato this note is held like on the guitar what we call a hammer on where you're holding this note and then pulling the other note in before you let go of that note so legato and then what happens is this two beat note because it's the end of a phrase is cut just a little bit short so there's a little bit of white space okay the same here ba da dum 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 ba da 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 see so it's, you got the staccato there and then a little legato staccatos legato and reading those marks brings in the emotion you'll notice also p so it starts soft then these little things people call hairpins, which are the dynamic markings. Here you have a crescendo. On this one beat figure, it's getting louder. So it's going from a P to a moderate voice. And then here it goes back down again. Then here we're at mezzo forte, that is medium volume, or I like to call it speech level volume. And then you'll see the phrasing marks are just showing the beginning and the end of each of the phrasings. Now here we have this long da 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 one sentence where before that we have ba da da bum da 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 right so these little rockers known as slurs these slurs give us the the phrasing of the piece so we can bring it forward. Now, after he plays this part, naturally he comes in here with a forte where it's loud, and then it comes back down to voice or speech level, and then it slowly diminishes. And here, dim not only means get smaller or uh, softer, but it could also be a slight slowing down of the thing. So it sounds as if the light is dimming out and then here at the end we wind up at pianissimo so it starts at pianissimo gets to normal while volume level comes back down then this whole section here is at vo normal volume level right there it swells and then comes back down and you have these short phrases and then this long phrase 
right? And then here, these notes are independent, and you'll also notice that these do not have staccato markings. They have these little arrowheads, and this means accent. Bum, 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 ba, ba, bum, 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 bum. So they're being expressed. Bum, 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 ba, da, dum, bum, 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 ba, da, dum, ba, da, dum. Bum, ba, da, dum, ba, da, dum, bum, bum, ba, da, dum, bum. So please look beyond the notes. Look at the phrasing marks, and they are telling you how to mm, express the music dramatically in the most elegant and sophisticated way that you can. And it brings more of the emotion and more of the intent of the song across to you. Now, these are just shadows. And what you have to do is also read between the lines and ask yourself, okay, if I were Bach and I were writing this, how would it be expressed at that period of time emotionally? So you try to get into the story and try to express it emotionally and try to express it as a style from that time period. So that's it for today. I'd like to pull the camera back here so I can look at you nice and close and say thank you all so much for staying with us through this series. By now, you should be able to look at a piece of music, use the code words to sing through it. We're going to start now with this weekly series of start showing you how to transpose or how to decode these lines and spaces into numbers and then how to use those numbers in order to express the melody. And you'll see that most cases we find out from the key signature where the number one is. In this case, it's a minor key signature. You have the B flat, the E flat, and then what happens is four notes down, one, two, three, four, with the last flat, four notes down is where the number one is. So this is starting on one and it's playing a minor scale. So if you were to pull out the natural minor intervalometer, put it on any key, anywhere, it doesn't have to be in G, you could do it in C if you're comfortable with C. Uh, you can put it in A minor and then play it in A minor. And the nice thing in A minor is these sharps and flats would only be black keys as they come up and all the rest of the notes would be white keys. So you could play this whole thing in A minor as white keys, never hardly ever touch a black key, and it would sound the same. And you'd be transposing into another key. You could even translate this from, well, I could translate it from minor to major, but the problem is minor songs being played in major sound pretty bad. However, if this were in major, I could play it with the minor scale and it would sound kind of groovy. It would sadden the song down and it would make it kind of uh, Croatian or Russian sounding. It would sound like that part of the world over there and you would get a whole kind of interesting sound. If you do that with Twinkle Star, or you do that with Mary Had a Little Lamb, it's kind of interesting when you change those majors to minors, what comes out. It still sounds like Mary Had a Little Lamb, but it's really sad and very Russian sounding, okay? so. We'll see you next week. Uh, later on tonight, we will be posting these again. And in the diddly do down below will be the PDF file for the intervalometer. The, the kids call it a slider because it slides behind the black keys of the piano. And I think if you take a look here, you can see Angel has, uh, looks like our picture's frozen. <laughs> so our internet isn't working right now. So uh, with my voice, we'll call it a night. Thank you. Bless everybody. And we'll see you all next time. Same time, same station here at Mr. Natchel's Music School. Ah, it's working again. And...